Today we're talking to Dr Rob Aldridge from the University College London. Rob, thank you for interviewing with Infectious Diseases Hub. Thanks very much for having me. Firstly, could you introduce yourself and tell us a bit about your career to date? Yeah, so my name is Dr Rob Aldridge, I'm from University College London and I'm an academic clinical lecturer. My first degree was actually in engineering, um, uh, after which I had a little bit of a career in banking and, com and management consultancy before realising that actually I wanted to study medicine and, and undertake research. You have quite an unusual and varied background. What do you think this brings to your research? Yeah, it really is a bit <laughs> varied. Um, I think it, what it allows me to do is bridge different disciplines. So, for example, the engineering the degree that I have means that I'm quite confident in using numbers and quantitative analysis, perhaps more than other public health and medical researchers are able to do. And it means I'm able to undertake economic analysis and ma mathematical modelling uh, research. But at the same time, having the clinical experience that I have means that I can understand and interpret the kind of clinical relevance of those models, of those, those, those quantitative data, and, and, and bring it to life and understand where it might be useful in, in, in clinical practice. Could you provide an introduction into the projects you're currently working on? The first one is uh, looking at migrants and with a particular focus on tuberculosis. So we just finished a large study that looked at screening for TB in migrants and what happened to, to migrants after they subsequently arrived in the UK having been screened as part of their visa process for TB. And we were able to identify um, who was at greatest risk of TB um, and understand what the how we could improve the screening process to make sure that migrants were, were getting a, a, a good screening and that subsequently their health was, risk was reduced of, of, of TB. And, and really importantly, we were able to show that they were um, not causing the spread of TB in the UK population, which I think goes against a lot of the existing kind of media coverage of, of migration and tuberculosis. The second kind of big piece of work I'm uh, leading right now is looking at homeless hospital uh, discharge schemes which are schemes that provide care, in-reach care to homeless people when they're admitted to hospital and we're undertaking an evaluation for the NIHR to see whether they do help um, homeless people after they've been admitted to hospital and what subsequently, subsequently happens to those homeless people. And then the third kind of big piece of work that I'm leaning on is understanding how you can use electronic health records and big data for uh, understanding the, the general population health needs um, as a whole, so not just focusing on migrants and, and homeless people, but then within that also trying to identify migrants and homeless people so we can understand what the health needs are of the population. As you've mentioned, you've carried out a lot of research into vulnerable and marginalised populations, for example migrants and the homeless. Why do you think this is important and what has the response to this been? Yeah, I think it's the reason I think it's important. The reason I got into this area was that clearly, if you think about tuberculosis, there were um, the majority of our um, tuberculosis notifications in the UK are among individuals not born in the UK, and there wasn't that much research focused on that. And the other uh, point being is that a lot of the data that we have doesn't uh, allow migrants to be identified within the data sets, and so it was an issue that to me seemed like it wasn't receiving enough attention and uh, that the data that we were using for, you know, as epidemiologists we're interested in data, the data that we were using wasn't good enough to really understand what the problems were to be able to tackle those issues. So uh, that, that's really what got me interested in it and the same applies to homeless people. Homeless people actually even more so the, the migrants have very, are very difficult to identify within data sets. We don't, all of the routine um, GP and hospital records don't have a kind of flag that says this individual is homeless and even our death certificates don't have that sort of flag within them. So at the moment both migrants and homeless people are essentially invisible within the data um, and the response to it has been really um, positive. I think the migrant and homeless populations um, are, are really keen for their data to be used in this way and to, to make their, to, for us to be able to start to understand what the health issues are that they face um, and then f also from the sort of Department of Health and NHS side of things I think there's a, a growing recognition that we need to, to, to be able to identify the populations and use that, that data to improve their health. So I think overall um, it's, it's generally been a positive experience. How do you hope your research will affect practice on the front line of care? 
I, I, I mean, the, the main reason for me doing this research is to identify what the problems are so that we can start to tackle that. A, a nice, one of the nice examples of, of something fairly simple that we did over the last few years uh, for how it has directly impacted the care is a study that we conducted in London um, where I work with a, a service called Find and Treat which is a mobile x-ray unit that goes around homeless hostels in London screening for active tuberculosis and we realised that actually probably a lot of the people that get on the van to be screened for TB at these hostel sites probably should be being vaccinated for influenza each year um, because they have a ri risk factor so they're under 65 so they don't meet the age criteria but they have asthma, diabetes, heart disease um, because those are much more prevalent in homeless populations but nobody was really thinking about this at the time so we did a really simple study where we asked everyone coming on the van do you have asthma, do you have heart disease, do you have diabetes um, and we showed that actually the rates of those conditions were very high and that at the time they were, um, ver they were very few of them were getting influenza vaccination so we showed that compared to the general population they were at four times the risk of, of, of needing the influenza vaccination but they were at they, were have they had half the levels of of vaccination within their population compared to the general population. So a really nice illustration of the inverse care law by Julian Tudor Hart. And as a result of that, we were able to get NHS London to commission influenza vaccination on the van. So as of the last two years, people coming on the van during this kind of pre-season to, to influenza are being offered that vaccination as well as the screening for TB. And you know, that we will, there will almost certainly be cases of, of influenza that we've, we've prevented as a result of that work. So that, that's a nice illustration of the sorts of things that we, we've, where we've been able to directly impact care for patients. How have the emergence of current technologies impacted your field and how are you utilising technology in your research? Yeah, so I, the, the building that we're sat in today is the Institute of Health Informatics and we specialise in using new digital technologies to improve health generally and obviously my interest is in, in marginalised populations and, a, and another nice example of where we've done this is in the same group, the homeless population group um, where, so for tuberculosis, if you're diagnosed with tuberculosis it's a long course of treatment that you have to undergo anywhere from six months if you've got uh, standard uh, fully sensitive TB up to two years if you've got multi-drug resistant TB and homeless people obviously have a lot of issues in terms of being able to access their care and, and leading um, quite vulnerable and chaotic lifestyles and uh, in the current guidance is that a homeless person that has TB should be given directly observed treatment which means that they need to go to hospital two or three times at least three times a week to have their tablets given to them and observed in taking and we've set up a randomized controlled trial whereby we are giving a mobile phone to homeless populations and allowing them to take their tablets in wherever they are um, on a daily basis so not just three times a week on a daily basis uh, and send us in video clips uh, of them taking their treatment and the nurses in this building here read those clips every day and send a message to the to the patient saying thank you we've we've, we've seen your your clip um, if they've got any side effects they report them to us if they've got any report uh, problems they report them to us on those video clips and we can connect them up into to their care um, and we I can't tell you the results of the study uh, yet because it's not quite finished but we stopped it early um, because it was looking extremely extremely positive and we're currently undertaking the final analysis. What do you consider to be the greatest challenges currently hindering the field of infectious disease epidemiology? I mean, so my, my focus is obviously data, um, and I think data is a, is a big problem globally. Um, so globally and here in the UK, the, the problem is that those that, that are at the highest risk of infectious diseases are the populations that we have the worst data on. Um, so if you think about it in sub-Saharan Africa, the uh, the death certificates for, for people that are dying of infectious diseases are, they don't have routine death data uh, just as a general problem. So I, I'm a collaborator on the Global Burden of Disease study which tries to estimate disease burden around the world um, and, and it's well acknowledged that the data on those, those, those populations that are high at risk, highest risk generally, so we're just talking about countries now, are, are those that have the worst data and again here in the UK it's again homeless persons, um, migrants, prisoners, drug users, sex workers that have the worst data and are probably at the highest risk of infectious diseases. Um, so I think 
in terms of if we're just thinking about infectious disease epidemiology, I think sorting out our issues around the, those, the data on those populations that are at highest risk is probably one of the biggest uh, issues we need to tackle. The, 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 if we get that right, we can then have we then have a good foundation in which to take things forward and to understand how we can improve the health of, of, of those populations. Finally, looking forward, how close are we to eliminating health inequalities and what steps could help bring this about faster? I think we're still a long way. Um, the infections and inequalities are not improving and if we think about the research that I do, those groups that are the, really the highest risk aren't even in the, the data at the moment and I think once we routinely start to include migrants and homeless populations within our routine data we'll realise that actually there are quite severe inequalities in, in terms of infectious disease and other health outcomes. So. Tackling the data issue is going to be a problem. Uh, going to be something we need to solve in terms of sorting out that problem. Because once we've got that data, we can monitor it and monitor progress. Um, in terms of how we can solve the problem, I think if you if you talk to someone like Dr. Al Story, who runs the Find and Treat service that I mentioned earlier, he is very keen that really we shouldn't need services like his. That we should be able to provide for marginalised and, and and vulnerable populations such as homeless people in our routine care. And I think. When the way that we will really tackle the, the inequalities that still exist is by being able to provide for those individuals within routine care. And when we get to that, that point, then, then we will be close to, to, uh, to eliminating inequalities in, 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 in infectious disease.